Patterson was founded in 1792, and its first industry was cotton spinning. By 1814, Patterson had 11 cotton mills, and by 1827, there were 15 cotton mills. Now, with weaving added to spinning. There were also three machine shops, including Godwin, Rogers, and Company. Also a rolling mill run by John Colt. These shops served the textile mill. As the new technology of steam locomotives emerged, our machine shops began to expand their horizons. Thomas Rogers was a 20-year-old journeyman carpenter when he arrived in Patterson in 1812. At the time, machines were made of wood with small amounts of metal, and carpenters like Rogers were in demand. In 1819, he partnered with John C. Clark, Jr., son of John Clark, Sr., who is considered the father of machining in Patterson. John Clark, Sr. also brought the Arkwright water frame to Patterson from England. Thomas Rogers and John Clark, Jr. added Abraham Godwin, Jr., and his capital made the firm stronger. They built looms and other machines for the cotton trade. They also spun cotton. In 1831, Rogers sold his share of Godwin, Rogers & Company and formed a new partnership with Morris Ketchum and Jasper Grosvenor, money men from New York. The new firm built the Jefferson Mill on the Upper Raceway, their first mill building. This was the newest stretch of the raceway system. The new business was named Rogers, Ketchum & Grosvenor. Railroad fever was in the air. In 1825, The Stockton and Darlington Railway in Britain became the first public railway to use steam locomotives. The news reached America, and up and down the East Coast, railroads were chartered, among them the Granite Railway in Massachusetts in 1826, the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad in New York in 1826, and the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in 1827. The Patterson and Hudson Railroad was chartered in 1831 and opened in 1834. The first railroads mixed horse-drawn carriages with steam locomotives and even stationary engines. The earliest tracks were made of wood with wrought iron laid on top of the wooden rails. In 1830, New Jersey engineer and lawyer John Stevens invented the wrought iron T-rail, which was a vast improvement. The T-rail would become standard and remains so to this day. It was first used on his Camden and Amboy Railroad. The locomotive bug soon hit Rogers, Ketchum, and Grosvenor. At the time, the trade of machinist did not exist as a single set of skills. Carpenters, blacksmiths, foundrymen, and millwrights did the tasks that would later be combined in a single machine shop. The first locomotive designed and built in America was Peter Cooper's Tom Thumb. It was assembled for demonstration purposes only. The first locomotive designed for actual service on a railroad line was the best friend built by the West Point Foundry. Another early locomotive was the DeWitt Clinton built at the West Point Foundry for the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad. Its first trip was from Albany to Schenectady on August 9, 1831. Perhaps it was luck that brought Horatio Allen, chief engineer of the South Carolina Railroad, to Rogers Mill in 1832. Allen needed to find a shop able to build 100 sets of wheels and axles. He traveled up and down the East Coast and met Thomas Rogers in Patterson. Rogers was judged the right man for the job. It took some time to complete the task, as Rogers had to create tools, gauges, and jigs needed to do the work. Paul and Beggs were Patterson millwrights, and in 1835 they started work on a locomotive of their own design. This should have been Patterson's first, but their mill was destroyed in a fire, and with it their locomotive was destroyed as well. Patterson's mill owners brought their millwright work to Rogers, whose firm soon acquired what was salvageable of Paul and Beggs' machinery. Rogers built a millwright's shop, and William Swinburne, Rogers' pattern maker, took charge of this aspect of Rogers' business. Thomas Rogers learned the trade of locomotive building when he was tasked with assembling the McNeil, a British engine purchased by the Patterson and Hudson Railroad. Rogers' pattern maker made drawings and patterns of every part of the McNeil. In 1835, the New Jersey Railroad and Transportation Company asked Rogers to design and build a locomotive. It took 18 months for Rogers to complete the new engine, but after testing, it was sold to a different company, the Mad River and Lake Erie Railroad in Ohio. The engine went to Jersey City, possibly by rail, and then to Albany by schooner. From there, it was sent along the Erie Canal and arrived at the town of Sandusky on November 17, 1837. It was the first locomotive to cross the Alleghenies, though it crossed by canal boat. When it reached Ohio, the Mad River and Lake Erie Railroad had not yet been built. 
The Sandusky included two improvements worth noting. One was the creation of drive wheels of cast iron with hollow spokes and rim. Up until that time, drive wheels were made like wagon wheels with wooden spokes. The second improvement was the addition of counterbalancing in the drive wheels to counteract the weight of the crank and the drive shaft. Both of these improvements became standard. The railroad business required many improvements to grow. One problem was the poor quality of American trackage. While British roadbeds were well engineered and carefully laid out, American lines were laid out quickly and with less attention to detail. To make sure that a locomotive stayed on the tracks, U.S. builders added a small truck in front of the drive wheels to make sure that the locomotive would be less affected by inequalities of the rail, which means that they needed the extra wheels to stay on the tracks. The following example shows how poor quality tracks impacted the railroad business. In 1827, the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company ordered three locomotives from Great Britain, one of them being the Sturbridge Lion. After the locomotive was ready for testing, it was discovered that the engine was too heavy for the tracks. None of the locomotives that they bought were used for the purpose for which they were designed. Railroads also needed better communications. In Britain, an early telegraph was patented in 1837. In the U.S., Samuel Morse, working with Alfred Vail, demonstrated his telegraph to Congress in 1844. By 1850, the United States had 9,000 miles of railroads and 20,000 miles of telegraph lines. By 1860, there were 30,000 miles of rails and 50,000 miles of telegraph lines. With the telegraph, we had real-time communications between stations. Then there was fuel. While European locomotives used coal, American locomotives used wood. In America, for coal to be available, we needed better transportation. First canals, and then the railroads themselves. Until 1870, wood was the fuel of choice in most parts of the United States. But wood and coal were not interchangeable. They required different grates in the firebox and different chimneys. Before the Civil War, most railroads still relied on wood rails covered with iron. These tracks limited the speed of a locomotive to less than 20 miles per hour. A story that illustrates the slow speed of early trains is that of the great locomotive chase where Confederate soldiers chase Union raiders who have captured a locomotive, the General. If the General had been able to travel as fast as 50 miles per hour, it would have been unreachable. But with the poor tracks, the general was never able to shake its Confederate pursuers. The general was built by Rogers, Ketchum, and Grosvenor in 1855 for the Western and Atlantic Railroad. The Texas was the engine that eventually chased it down. It was built just down Market Street from Rogers by Danforth, Cook, and Company in October of 1856. Patterson locomotives were well represented across America. For example, when the Golden Spike was driven connecting the Union and Central Pacific Railroads, one of the two locomotives present was Union Pacific No. 119, built at Rogers Locomotive Machine Works in 1868. This is the new name for the reorganized firm that was established after Thomas Rogers died in 1856. Roger's shop was the place for ambitious young men who were looking for opportunity. Roger's pattern maker, William Swinburne, left Roger's in 1845 to form his own machine shop with another Roger's employee, Samuel Smith, who had been foreman and mold maker. The new firm was Swinburne, Smith & Company, eventually renamed the New Jersey Locomotive and Machine Works. After the Panic of 1857, it became Grant Locomotive Works. And let's not forget the canals. In the 1830s, canals could transport heavier loads than could railroads. Between the 1830s and the 1860s, railroads reached parity with canals and then superseded them. An example is with the Morris Canal, which served Patterson and a string of towns from Newark and Jersey City to Phillipsburg, crossing the New Jersey Highlands. It brought coal from eastern Pennsylvania to New York and iron ore from the highlands 
to mill towns like Patterson. By 1871, the canal was in decline. By the turn of the century, the canal was obsolete. Another man who was associated with Thomas Rogers was Charles Danforth. Danforth began his career in a cotton mill in Norton, Massachusetts. He invented an improvement to the spinning frame known as the Danforth frame or cap spinner. He engaged the firm of Godwin, Rogers, and Clark to make his invention. He eventually replaced Rogers as a partner, and when the business dissolved in 1840, he took over the business, renamed as Charles Danforth & Company. In 1852, Danforth added John Cook as partner. Cook had been superintendent of Rogers, Ketchum, and Grosvenor. The new company was Danforth, Cook, and Company. After the deaths of both Charles Danforth and John Cook, the company was reorganized under John Cook's sons as Cook Locomotive and Machine Works. In 1901, Cook Locomotive merged with several of its competitors to create the American Locomotive Company. Their principal headquarters was in Schenectady, New York. Rogers built some 6,000 engines in its day and was known for its innovations and high quality. Though the Baldwin Works of Philadelphia was founded a few years before Rogers, they both represent the very dawn of the locomotive industry, and they both survived long enough to see the high-powered locomotives that arrived by the end of the 1800s. Danforth, Cook, and Company built some 3,000 locomotives in its time. Cook Locomotive created a second campus in South Patterson, and activity continued there until 1923.